Good morning. I'm delighted to welcome you to the King Institute for Faith and Culture this morning. We uh, are very pleased, as always, to welcome back King graduate uh, Catherine Patterson, the class of 1954. I'm going to leave it to Kimberly Brubaker Bradley to introduce Catherine in a minute. Uh, let me mention that our series, Listen to Your Life, continues uh, one more time this fall. We are going to welcome Peter Croft, the grandson of Bible translator J.B. Phillips, on November the 8th. Today's event will be followed by a coffee reception in the Tadlock House, and you're very welcome to join us for coffee and snacks. Uh, Tadlock is across the oval that way. Tonight, Catherine will be in conversation with Kim at First Presbyterian Church at 7 o'clock, and you're very welcome to that as, uh, as well. Delighted to have many of you joining us online as well, and the event this evening will also be streamed. So both of those will be available by stream or in person uh, or by recording later on. It's been a joy to host Catherine uh, here since she was a student. I learned a bit more about the campus and what it was like a few decades ago this morning as we drove up and remembered as well that we are a campus full of stairs uh, as we labored our way into this building. Uh, but it's good to have you here, and I'm glad to welcome Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. Kimberly lives here in Bristol, uh, where she writes children's novels as well. She has been a two-time Newbery honoree, and uh, we are delighted to have her here, first of all to introduce Catherine, and then later tonight to be in conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to her to introduce Catherine Patterson. Good morning. As Martin said, I'm Kim Bradley, and I live here in Bristol. Um, the Great Gilly Hopkins by Catherine Patterson won the Newbery Honor and a National Book Award the year I was in fifth grade. And this book comes from when it was a textbook for my college class in children's literature, which changed the trajectory of my life uh, from 1987. And when Catherine was here three years ago, she we know the year because she dated it, um, signed it for me. But I told her just a minute ago I was going to tell her about the first time we met, which I didn't expect she'd remember. Um, 19 years ago, I went to the American Library Association meeting in Atlanta. I had just published my fourth book. None of them were a very big deal. Uh, and I was really driving down to ALA because it sounded more fun than the family event I was trying to skip. So um, <laughs> I had let my editors know. And I, my, my editor for my first three novels had changed houses and was now with Penguin. Uh, her name is Lori Hornick. And she said, well, you need to come and, and to this author event we're having and you'll, you know, where people can meet you. And I said, well, Lori, I don't have any books out with you. And she said, but you're going to. And that was true. I had one uh, under contract. She said, so come anyway. I said, well, I don't. Uh, and she said, I'll introduce you to Katherine Patterson. And I said, really? She said, you can even have dinner with her. So of course I went. And, um, and it was uh, kind of a meet and greet for all the librarians. And afterward, there was dinner just for the authors. And I did sit at a table with about, it was, it was like maybe 12 people in this circular table. And Catherine was there, kind of off to one side, talking to Jane Yolen and Patricia Lee Gouch. And uh, Lawrence Yep, I believe, was at the table. These are all huge names. And I was standing there. And right across me was another author about the same. I can't remember his name now. I want to say Gary Schmidt, but I'm sure that wasn't right. Um, but it was somebody that was also just starting their career, and both of us kept doing these little sideline looks like, look over there, look who's there, look at that. It was very, very cool. So it's still very cool for me to be here uh, in any way with Catherine, who is probably the, uh, I think has to be the, the most decorated children's book author from America. Uh, I just learned that she is a Library of Congress living legend, which is pretty cool. Um, Two-time Newbery Award winner, two-time National Book Award winner. She's won the American Lifetime Achievement Award for Children's Literature, the Hans Christian Andersen and the Astrid Lingerman, which are both uh, International Lifetime Achievement Awards. Uh, pretty big deal. Um, but I think the reason that I am here is not so much because of all the shiny stuff that she has won, but for the reason that she's won it which is that her writing combines her own talents of honesty and curiosity and empathy. And I very much lis uh, uh, enjoy listening to her. I'm sure you will, too. Oh. 
Well, it's <coughs> humbling and wonderful to be beautifully introduced by a, a writer who's writing you extravagantly admire. Uh, she is a wonderful writer, and uh, read her books. Uh, it's great to be back at King, although uh, I'm glad I was here three years ago, so the campus doesn't seem quite so strange to me as it did when I left in 1954. Uh, but uh, I always, uh, feel a very warm welcome here, and I love Bristol. I love the little hotel next to the favorite museum, which is the uh, Birth of Country Music Museum, which is, I tell everybody in Vermont that it's worth a trip to Bristol to see the museum, and well, they could drop over to the beautiful campus of King University if they so inclined. Um, but anyhow, thank you for inviting me, and it's lovely to be here with you. On October the 31st, yes, Halloween, I will turn 89 years old. Now, that's probably not hard for you to believe, looking at my white hair and very wrinkled face, but it's actually rather hard for me to believe. And people say, well, you're only as old as you feel, and that doesn't work because a lot of the time I feel like I'm about nine or 10 years old, and nobody's gonna take me for that. And so I had an early reaction to this year's theme, which is listen to your life and thinking, boy, on the day I speak, I'll be 13 days short of 89, and that's an awful lot of life to listen to. Once when I was younger and much more clever than I am now, I declared that Socrates, by way of Plato, was wrong when he said the unexamined life was not worth living. And I said to myself, and maybe I said it out loud, I'm afraid I might have, I don't waste time examining my life and it feels quite worth living. A lot of water has gone under the bridge since that day, and I'm not nearly as clever as I was then. I think examining one's life, listening to one's life, is a very good thing to do. Uh, Socrates and your parents get wiser as you get older. Surely, listening to your life, the first step is learning how to listen which is a problem. I come from a long line of talkative women. I remember coming home from school one day and realizing that my mother was having one of her tea parties in the living room. So I snuck around to the back and climbed up the back stairs to the apartment. And there was my father standing in the kitchen with one ear cocked to the door, listening to the cacophony of women's voices on the other side. And he turned to me with this bemused expression on his face and said, who is listening? Um, the answer obviously was no one. Uh, my, my sister Anne, who is also a King graduate, um, spent her career uh, teaching at Gallaudet University, which as you know, is a university devoted uh, to a, giving a university education to those who are deaf or, or hard of hearing. And Anne says that most people would rather be deaf than blind if they had to choose, but they'd be wrong. Blindness, blindness of course, is tragic, but you don't get isolated from society when you're blind the way you do when you're deaf. And as I've gotten older and harder of hearing, I've come to understand this. Last year, my audiologist suggested that I might want to buy a new pair of hearing aids because the technology was improving all the time. And so I forked over an enormous sum of money for a new pair of hearing aids. And then I said to Marcia, now will I be able to hear the punchline? 
and she laughed. It's something that all of us who are hard of hearing understand. When someone is telling a wonderful story or a joke, if you listen well and you have good hearing aids, you can hear nearly every word until they get to the punchline and their voices go down to a low mumble. <clears throat> then what do you do? Do you laugh weakly and pretend that you understood? Or worse yet, do you punch your neighbor and say, what, is, what was it? What did they say? And see the very annoyed look on your neighbor's face who wants to go on with the conversation as it's already le left you long behind. And as much as I strain to hear, boy, do I love to be listened to. How many times at the table at Westview Meadows am I hardly bothering to listen to my neighbor's story because I'm jumping up and down inside to tell my own delicious story that happens to top his very tame one. And then just as I'm about to get to the best part of my story, the server comes in with the entree and by the time she's gotten each dish to each person at the table, the conversation has gone somewhere else and I never get to tell my punchline, which I, of course, would thoughtfully tell loud enough for everyone at the table to hear. <clears throat> now, if you're a writer, an aspiring or misunderstood politician, a retired general, or actor, or celebrity, or actually almost anybody at all, examining your life by writing and publishing your memoir is the thing to do. I always swore I would never write a memoir, and then somehow I managed to write a pseudo-memoir, uh, and it was published in 2014 and was out of print sooner than it, in less time than it took to write it. So I think I should have stuck to books for young readers. But Susie Coyne, who is the world's most hardworking and delightful agent, does not like to see her clients', clients books go out of print. So she has persuaded John Knox Westminster Press to breathe new life into the old stories of my life. So once again, I'm having to listen to the stories I thought I'd put to rest uh, some time ago. Uh, Jeanette Larson, the editor for this resurrected, slightly expanded version of my life, wanted an addendum. She asked me to consider my life alongside the books I have written and see if there's a common thread, something that runs through the whole of who I am and what I have written. I read the book through and the thread became obvious to me. This is what I sent to Jeanette, framed with lines from a favorite hymn. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Some years ago, a critic said that the theme that ran through all my books was hope. But as I reread my earlier version of stories of my life, I came to a different conclusion. I think the thread that connects all of my life and what I have written is grace. Grace is unmerited favor and it has poured down on me all the days of my long life. I was blessed with two parents who not only loved God and each other, but also me, the whiny little show-off, who was their second daughter. Even if they were rocky times as I grew up, it is a joy to remember the teachers and friends who helped me find a way when there was no way. At my college and seminaries, my narrow view of faith 
broadened, and not incidentally, I was set on the path to become a writer. My life in Japan was grace upon grace, as those whom I had once hated loved me without judgment, and I was freed and to love them in return. I have been given in abundance the family I long to have, beginning with John, whose very name means God is gracious. Grace abounds in my four loving children, who, when at 86, I fell on Vermont ice and broke my leg and ankle, all of them took time from their busy lives to help nurse their aged parent back to full mobility. And the gift of my children has expanded as they have formed their own families, spouses and grandchildren who are grace notes in my life as well. About the same time, at Virginia, who had been my editor for 40 years, was no longer able to edit. John became ill. After he died, I decided to retire from writing. The two main supports of my writing life were gone. I wasn't even sad about it. I'd always preferred reading to writing. Now I could read all I wanted to. But Grace, or actually my sons, intervened. When on nursing duty, John Jr. ordered a new work desk that would accommodate a wheelchair. And David presented me with weights so I would be sturdy enough to wheel the blinking chair into place. <laughs> so here I sit, looking out my window at the Vermont mountains, still typing away. I'm no longer in the 1830s farmhouse in Barrie. I'm living happily and independently in a retirement community eight miles up the road. So I'm still close to my friends of many years in central Vermont and the First Presbyterian Church in Barrie, within whose loving fellowship I have experienced the true communion of the saints. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. I will, of course, edit what I sent to Jeanette many times before the new edition is published next year. But the fact remains, I have indeed lived a grace-filled life. There was no doubt in my mind about that. But when I was preparing this talk, I thought I should go back and reread all 18 of my novels and see if what I had told Jeanette was true. Is grace the thread that runs through all my books as well as my life? But I got so busy catching up with Kimberly Broombecker, Bradley's astounding novels, that I didn't have to, time to reread all my own. I finally put aside her books, but that left time to read only the first of my now 18 novels. Okay, I said to myself, this is a test. Where is grace found in my very first novel? Let's see. It was published in 1973, which makes it 48 years old this fall. It's called The Sign of the Chrysanthemum, and its setting is 12th century Japan, which is long before the first Portuguese Christian missionary arrived in the 17th century. So even though a biblical concept of grace had not yet been articulated in Japan, we know, don't we, that God loves all of creation. So we must surely believe that God's grace is present in every time, every place, every creature, indeed in every rock and dandelion. But is it present in my book? 
I certainly wasn't planning to explore the concept of grace when I was working on it. I knew I wanted to write a story set in Japan. I was a little homesick for Japan. And if I wrote a story set in the past, it would give me a chance to study Japanese history. I wasn't thinking about genre or audience, and I'm sure I didn't realize that a book written for young people set in 12th century Japan would be considered unmarketable by almost any American publisher. But for me to write it in the first place, a novel has to have more than a fascinating setting and a decent plot. It has to have a theme and characters I'm passionate about. It has to come from my heart, not just my mind. And the heart of this novel came from an unexpected place, from my five-year-old daughter. Lynn, who has given me permission to tell this story, was born in Hong Kong in the fall of 1962. When she was about three weeks old, she was found on the sidewalk by a policeman and taken to an orphanage where she lived for more than two years before she came to be our daughter. Her initial adjustment was horrendous. And again in 1966, when we moved from New Jersey to Maryland, a lot of it came unglued and had to be rebuilt. But by the time she was five and a half, life had again settled down pretty well for her. Still, there were days when, for no apparent reason, the bright little girl she had become would simply disappear. In her place would be a silent waif. It was as though the child we knew had simply pulled down a thick curtain that we could not push through. It might go on for days, and it scared me. Where had she gone? What was she experiencing behind that blank stare? And how on earth could I reach her? The curtain had been closed for several days. I had tried everything, cajoling, begging, holding her. Nothing helped. One evening when I was making supper, she climbed up on a high kitchen stool and sat there. Her tiny body present, the rest of her shut away. I began to talk to her in a normal tone of voice. There was no reply, no indication that she'd even heard. The harder I tried, the more tense I became. And then I did what any good mother would do under the circumstances. I lost my temper. Lynn, I yelled at her, how can I help you if you won't tell me what's the matter? She jerked her attention, her eyes wide open. Why did that woman give me away? It began to pour out. Why had she been given away? We had never told her she was a foundling. It seemed too harsh. Just that her mother had not been able to keep her and wanted her to have a good home. I repeated this adding that I was sure that her mother would not have given her away if there had been any possibility that she could take care of her baby. Was her mother alive, she asked. Was she all right? Of course, I couldn't answer those questions. But she let me try to comfort and assure her. She never again, even in adolescence, pull down that curtain again. She's a mother now herself, and she and Stephen have raised two beautiful, accomplished 
daughters. I watched her give her own babies all the care that she had never had as an infant, but that somehow she knew how to give. She is a wonder, and I cannot tell you how much I admire her. But listening to her cry out that day, I heard the heart of the story I wanted to write. What must it be like, I wondered, to have a parent somewhere whom you do not know? It is no marvel to me now that the sign of the chrysanthemum had difficulty finding a publisher. It's set in the civil strife of 12th century Japan. The central character is a thieving bastard who is searching for the father he never knew and who probably doesn't even know he exists. The girl the boy cares for ends up in a brothel. I didn't put her there because I wanted to scandalize potential readers, but because a beautiful 13-year-old girl in 12th century Japan who had no one to protect her would most likely end up in a brothel, and the penniless boy who loves her would be powerless to rescue her. Now, at some point, I must have realized that I hadn't, certainly not in the late 60s, seen a lot of books for young readers along this line. But when I was writing The Sign of the Chrysanthemum, I, I wasn't, to be honest, worrying about readers. I was writing a story I needed and wanted to write, as honestly and as well as I knew how. Now, I had told Jeanette that the thread that runs through my life and that of my books was grace. So as I read this 48-year-old book, set in a time and a place where the good news of God's love in Christ had never been heard, I searched for evidence of grace. And surprisingly, it wasn't hard to find. When our young protagonist is born, the Lord, the Damio of that place, fancying himself very clever, puts together two Chinese characters, the first meaning lacking and the second meaning name, guaranteeing that Muna, or lacking a name, will grow up as, as a despised outcast. When his mother dies, Muna stows away on a boat headed for the capital, determined to search out the noble samurai whom his mother has told him is his father. Also on board is a rogue samurai, a ronin, who saves the boy from the captain's ire and plans to use him for his own nefarious schemes. So far, not much evidence of grace. There is, however, another character in the story, a master sword maker. When Muna is left by the Ronin to die in a tavern fire, the sword maker rescues the boy, takes, his, takes him home, nurses him back to health. Now, at first, Muna is grateful and is happy to help with the cooking and the sweeping, but he begins to resent what he feels is women's work that is keeping him from his quest to locate his noble samurai father. One day, the ronin uh, reappears and claiming to be the boy's father, persuades the unhappy boy to steal a sword for him so he can regain his lost position in society. Muna, longing to be the son of a noble samurai, takes a sword and goes in search of the life he dreams is his true inheritance. Now, you don't need to read the book to realize how very wrong he is. But the choice has been made and Muna bears the terrible consequences. 
There's a scene that as I read, reread the book after all these years, I had misremembered. Aha, I had thought. That was certainly evidence of grace in my first novel. And it was, but not the scene as I had remembered it. When, despite his hopes, Muna does not return, the sword maker finally goes in search of the boy. Here is the actual scene, not the one I thought it was. By dusk, Fukuji had worked his way through the streets of the artisans and the body district until before him loomed the great ghostly bulk of Rashomon Gate, whose towers, some said, held the rotting flesh of the outcast dead, and under whose shadow crept the scum of the living. He walked slowly from booth to booth, buying nothing, speaking to no one, not really looking at those things his eyes seemed to be examining. For all his senses were straining for evidence of the boy's whereabouts. And then he saw him. He was huddled against a pillar as though he was freezing, though the evening air was hot and humid. Fukuji stepped into the shadow of a booth. What should he say? How could he approach the boy? Muna would think he had come for vengeance. Better not to speak until Muna could see his face and know he did not come in anger. He began to move toward the portico. The boy jumped to his feet. Fukuji could see that he was quivering. Muna, he shouted. But the boy ran into the darkness of the portico. Now, as I remembered it, the scene proceeded like Jesus' own parable. The good shepherd finds his lost sheep and bears them home rejoicing. I'd also mistakenly thought that the scene took place at the very end of the book, but it doesn't. This is the rest of the scene as it is in the printed book. He might, he might have found him. The boy, more likely, had darted into one of the openings in the tower. He might even now be gazing out at him, but he forced himself to turn around. He had been a fool to come, a fool to think he could find the boy, or that he should. Muna was not some metal the sword maker could pound to his own design. He was nearly a man. He must find his own way. Nope, not the ending I had remembered, <laughs> but surely a scene full of grace. For God does not pound his children into shape. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, Paul tells us. God's love, any godlike love, does not compel a response from the beloved. Grace is a gift that we are always free to accept or to reject. Which brings me to another scene, 10 pages later. Those 10 pages spell out fear and heartbreak. But finally, Muna knows that to keep the sword from falling into evil hands, he must dig it up from its hiding place in the forest and return it to its creator. So it is that one night, the sword maker hears someone at his door. A caller at this hour? The swordsmith put down the zither and carried a lamp to the front entryway. It was a strange sight that met his startled eyes. A beggar or a rag picker with filthy garments and long matted hair stood barefoot on the stones, but he was holding out a sword. 
Pukuji, I've brought back the sword. Then the swordsmith knew him. It was Mona. Speechless, the man took the sword. From his shredded tunic, the boy took the sheath, and placing this at Fukuji's feet, he turned to go. Wait. The man found his voice at last. Where are you going? The boy turned around. His eyes had gone dull again. Fukuji knelt, bringing his own face level with the boy's. You can't go back into the streets. Kiyomori has an army assembled on the banks of the Kamo. By morning, the city will flow with blood. He put down the lamp and busied himself, resheathing the sword. Stay a while with me here. He could see confusion in the boy's eyes now and a refusal coming, into, coming to the dry lips. But the sword maker put his powerful hand on the boy's arm and helped him into the house. If that's not grace, neither is Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Okay, Mrs. Patterson, you may be thinking, you have certainly covered your first book, but that was 14, 48 years and 17 years ago. What have you done for us lately? Well, tomorrow, maybe, <laughs> my 18th novel for young leaders, <laughs> readers is officially published. And did you find grace there? Grace abounding. But didn't you say it's about a child who makes a bargain with God and God doesn't keep his side of the bargain? Doesn't sound like grace to me. God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. William Cowper, 1731-1800. Mercy on us. Old English majors never die. They just fade into the leaves of literature. Seriously now, where did you get the idea for a cockamamie book like that? Well, to tell you the truth, I listened to my 10-year-old self, and there it was. The key word, my friends, is listen. Some years ago, I was invited to the island of Fiji for a conference on literacy that would include teachers from all around the Southeast Pacific Ocean. The conferees would be coming from tiny islands, many if not most of which I had never even heard the names of. I accepted the invitation because I was honored and thrilled, but the closer I came to the actual date, the more anxious I felt. What in the world did I have to say to these folks who had very few books, and most of those were handmade and printed on newsprint with large enough letters that every child in a class of more than 50 would be able to see each word. Just tell them stories, a friend suggested. But, I said, most of my stories are about books. Other than and those would be my books. Other than the, the leaders who invited me, these people never heard of me, much less will they know anything about my books. John joined me, joined me on the trip, and I really needed his support. In my briefcase was a story I had written, it was a speech I had written, and today I'm to tell the truth, I can hardly remember what I said in that speech. I do remember the opening night speech. It was by a professor at the University of Fiji. The speaker, like Plato, praised the oral tradition 
and suggested that the writing and publishing of books would destroy the culture of their islands. He didn't seem to see the contradiction in the fact that if he hadn't been able to access books, he wouldn't be able to quote Plato, uh, but never mind. I was anxious enough before he spoke. You can imagine how I felt afterwards. I got up the next morning to face that same audience in that lovely outdoor setting. Several hundred beautiful brown faces looked up at me expectantly. I took a deep breath and launched into the speech I had written, written weeks before in Vermont. I had no choice. It was the only thing I was prepared to say. A few minutes into my talk, I was aware that something very strange was happening. Something that had never happened to me before. The longer I spoke, the whatever it was grew stronger. It, it briefly crossed my mind that I might be making the best speech I'd ever made in my life. But I soon forgot that because it wasn't me. It was as if the whole audience was breathing with me and making the speech. I finished. I suppose there was applause. I can't honestly remember. I stumbled down to a seat beside John and saw on his, on his face the same stunned amazement that I was feeling. As soon as the announcements for the rest of the day's program were over, we fled to our dormitory room. What in the world had happened out there? Finally, we conclude that I had never before spoken to an audience of people who had grown up in the oral tradition. What we had felt, what we had experienced out there was listening. Listening that was so powerful that we could, it was palpable. We could feel it and be borne up by it. Plato was not wrong. When a culture forgets how to listen, something very precious, perhaps irretrievable, is lost. I will never regret growing up literate, but I would like to know how to listen the way I was listened to that day. Now, this is not a test. I never expect to experience from my audience <laughs> the quality of listening that was a gift to me that day in Fiji. And if your mind was on your biology lab or history quiz or the girl sitting behind you instead of my words, that's OK. My mind wanders all the time when I ought to be listening, especially to be truthful during my morning devotions when I mean to be listening for a word from God. Most of us, let's face it, are not good listeners. We need a lot of practice. During this series of talks, you and I have been given a chance to practice. We're being asked to listen to our lives. How does this kind of listening relate to the listening I experienced in Fiji that day? Doesn't any kind of listening call for awareness, for respect? Shouldn't we try to give the sounds of our own hearts the quality of listening that we owe to the voice of another person? and to the still, small voice of God, the word of grace within our own hearts. Well, for me, I'm going to stop talking right now and go 
Start practicing my listening skills, and so may you. Thank you.